Hello and welcome to Fontainebleau. Uh, we'll be looking at beautiful settings um, today and I'm here to talk to you about generative listening and presenting you the seven principles of generative listening. Generative listening is more than just active or deep listening. Generative listening goes beyond uh, as it creates new connections between the one who speaks and the one who listens. New connections that are truly generative. And that means that it creates new possibilities for action that neither parties had expected or even thought would be possible before entering the conversation. I'm here to talk to you about generative listening. Generative listening, which for me is uh, maybe the single most powerful transformational behavior. I'd like today to tell you a bit about generative listening and in particular to present you um, the seven principles for generative listening. I'm welcoming you in this wonderful setting which I hope will be conducive to entering a new disposition which is the basis of generative listening. Now you may know about active listening, deep listening. What's new about generative listening, you might wonder? Well, in fact, we call it generative listening because what happens when we enter this disposition is that new things happen. Entering this disposition means that you come in into a conversation and you come out with things that neither party had in mind before they entered. In other words, through the process of conversation in a disposition of generative listening, you can actually together create new thoughts, new ideas and new commitment for action. So, as you may decide to enter into a, a collective process of change or transformation in your organization, or you might want to facilitate a meeting in which you explore current practice and future possibilities, I'm advising you to listen to those seven principles for generative listening and see if you can embody them in your meeting, in your conversation. As I mentioned, there are seven principles and I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to go through them and explain to you what they're all about. Okay, so the first principle is called slowing down. And in fact, it's all about slowing down and noticing all of what is present. Very often when we enter a meeting, we've just come from somewhere else. Uh, maybe we've even had to rush to get here. And so what happens is that we're sitting down and we're still thinking about what's just happened in the meeting before or on the way to the meeting or maybe we're still thinking about what happened yesterday. We're not fully present. We haven't yet slowed down. We may also be rushing because we know that after this meeting there's something very important happening and we're already thinking ahead and our mind is racing. Here too, what happens is that we're not fully present. So the first principle, and it is the first because it's needed, to, it needs to be the first. This first principle is just to slow down. Notice, you know, what's present around you. Uh, who is there? What is the setting? How do you feel in that setting? Is this a comfortable setting? And in a way I'm inviting you here to Fontainebleau because it is, I think, a, a wonderful setting. So notice the setting, notice the people and really connect to the present moment as a way of really helping you to slow down and be here and be prepared to listen to other people. So that's the first principle, slowing down. The second principle is called listening with all my senses. Now, 
we're used to um, we used to, we're used to listening, of course, with our ears, and you know that's probably the primary way we listen. I would imagine. However, in the, in this uh, generative listening, the invitation is really to open up to what is happening with all our senses. And of course, you know, starting with the visual. In other words, not just listening to the words being uttered, but also, you know, looking at the body language, uh, looking at what is being conveyed through that body language, uh, picking up information that, that are beyond words, in effect. So opening up the visual senses, of course, but beyond hearing and visual, um, it's listening with the rest of the senses. And we know from various expressions that actually um, all our senses are involved when we interact with people. An expression like, you know, this left a bitter taste in my mouth, you know, is um, clearly referring to uh, another sense that we use in, in, uh, in connecting, in interacting. Having a gut feeling is another way to describe, you know, the, all the senses that are being involved. And so here the invitation is really to open up, to try to sense, like, like senses, to sense the whole experience, not just through hearing, but through all the senses. So that's the second principle, listening with all your senses. The third principle is listening to the words, listening to the images chosen. When somebody's speaking, they use particular words. They do that consciously, they do that unconsciously. But, you know, the fact is that we choose the words that we're uttering at that very moment to convey something. And so it's very important to tune our listening to those words and with the words chosen to the images that they convey. Because sometimes they are quite powerful. And, you know, because the person chose to use a powerful image, sometimes because it's just come out of them, unfiltered. Uh, however, that's, that's the way it's happened, and it's very important to uh, acknowledge that, to honour that, and to stay with that, to stay with the words, to stay with the images. In international, intercultural settings, um, you know, what often happens is that you know, what somebody says is translated and we're only hearing it through um, a headset or we're translating it in our, in our own mind um, into our own language. And my invitation here to really stay with that third principle is to be as literal as possible, to really translate the words that are being chosen in that language um, and you know, translate them, bring them into our own language, literally, so that we stay with the words chosen, the images chosen, and uh, with that, you know, the, the message that's being conveyed. So that's principle three, listening to the words and the images. Now, principle four, principle four is about listening to the emotions. And that's, uh, that's a very important principle. I mean, they're all important in a way. Um, this one is important because words are a means to an end. Uh, when we use words, we're trying to convey a message. And the message that we're conveying is not just a conceptual, intellectual, practical message. It's also a message that speaks about our emotional experience or emotional relationship with the experience that we're conveying. And so it's very important to tune ourselves to also that level of the message, that emotional level, so that we can pick it up. And we can pick it up by tuning to the tone of the voice, for example, by the pace of the speech, 
you know, if somebody um, suddenly slows down, looks for their words, or conversely, somebody may be accelerating, speaking fast, and we can feel that the passion is there, and that passion may be a positive energy, it may be also anger, who knows, but there's em emotion being conveyed. Now, of course, um, you know, other ways of picking up the emotion is through the silences. You know, if somebody starts a sentence and then leaves a silence until they go to the next sentence, it's important to stay with that silence, not fill it in, stay with it and see what is being conveyed through that silence. You know, another way of picking up emotional, um, the emotional level in the conversation is, you know, if, if the voice starts breaking, you know, somebody's, uh, you know, maybe their throat is tight or, or something of that, of that kind. So that's the principle four, very important, tune in to the emotional level, picking up what's, what is the emotion of the person who's speaking, of course, yes? We'll see later on that it's important to pick up our own emotions, but principle four is about tuning to the emotional level of the person who's speaking. Okay, enough for uh, principle four. Moving to principle five. Principle five is about suspending judgment. What do I mean by suspending judgment? Well, you know, the, the, the usual judgment that, of course, we need to suspend is, um, you know, what I'd call the moral judgment. Um, it's that judgment where we consciously and consciously, in our mind, or maybe even explicitly, we might say, um, oh, this is good, this is bad. I like this, I don't like that. Um, they should have done this or they shouldn't have done that. You know, this is what I would call the moral judgment. And in generative listening, if we want to be present to the experience of the other and welcome it as such, we need to suspend that moral judgment. The other judgment that we need to suspend, and maybe that's, that's a lesser known one, is what I would call the cognitive judgment. The cognitive judgment is the judgment that we use very often without even realizing it. The judgment that we use when we classify um, what we're hearing into our own mental boxes. Um, you know, for example, when we say, oh yeah, he, of course he's saying this because he's a man. You know, as if um, what's being said is only said because the person is a man, not, not because of a personal experience. You know, or equally he's saying this because, she's saying this because she's a woman. You know, or of course, you know, he's saying this because, um, you know, he has plenty of money. Or, uh, oh, of course, he's saying this because he's poor. So, in other words, we, it's as if we're framing and explaining the experience of the other through our own categories. So, that's one, one type of cognitive, cognitive judgment that we need to suspend. Another kind of um, cognitive judgment that is very important to suspend is the one when, in a way, we assume we know what the other is going to say. For example, in our own mind, or even sometimes, um, you know, verbally, out loud, we will finish the sentence that somebody is starting, you know, without leaving them time to actually finish it. I don't know if this happens to you. It, it happens to me, and I have to say to you that that's one of the things I particularly don't like um, when I'm in a conversation. Because otherwise, you know, if this happens, I feel that somebody knows already what I'm going to say. And if they know already what I'm going to say, then I might as well not say it. Uh, the other reason it, uh, it uh, particularly uh, annoys me is that usually what they say is not at all what I was going to say. So I feel like the person is really not attuned to what I'm trying to say, but they're in their own world. Hence the importance of suspending judgment. Okay, that was principle five, suspending judgment. Now, principle six um, is about noticing what I don't understand rather than what I don't like. 
Now, what do I mean by this? It's in a way connected to, um, to principle five, the cognitive judgment. Often what we do in our mind is very quickly decide whether we like or we don't like what's being offered to us in the conversation. Again, this may be conscious, it may be less conscious. Um, it's, you know, it may just appear in, in, um, you know, in the way, for example, we let ourselves be energized by, by what's being said or we let our mind drift away by what's being said. You know, it's a way of basically uh, responding. Um, you know, it's, it's almost like saying, yeah, I like this, it's really energizing me or, gosh, you know, I don't like this. Um, it's not taking me anywhere. I might as well let my mind wander. Or, you know, we might uh, feel that we want to respond straight away because, uh, you know, we don't like what's being said and we want to say something to counter it in a way or to, uh, to, to, to affirm, assert that, you know, we're not in agreement. Well, before doing that, and this is the point of, um, of principle six, before doing that, uh, principle six invites us to really check First of all, and this is crucial, did I really understand what they're trying to say? What am I responding to when I'm energized? Or what am I responding to when I'm bored? Or when I'm in disagreement? Do I really understand what's being said? Or actually, am I working on a various set of assumptions that I would, you know, it would be better if I could check them before actually responding? My own experience, and I work a lot with international groups, um, is that paradoxically maybe, people who don't speak the same language tend to be much more humble about not understanding and therefore practice much, much more often principle six than those who speak the same language. Because often when we speak the same language, we actually assume that we understand what the other is saying and these assumptions are our enemies, in a way, we could say. And these, these are the ones we really need to check. So principle six, do I really understand what the other is saying? Um, rather than just responding with liking or not liking. This now brings us to principle seven, and it's the seventh principle, the last one in the generative listening. Um, and this is about noticing what I am feeling whilst I'm hearing what the other one is saying. And this links to principle four, as I mentioned earlier on, about listening to the emotions. When we listen to people and they tell us their story, they tell us their perspective of the world, they tell us um, how they see things, how they would like things to change uh, and why. This is bound to trigger in us various emotions. And it's crucial that as well as paying attention to the other, we find a way and it could be at the same time or it can be you know, during pauses in the conversation between you know, short silences. It's crucial we find time to ask ourselves, okay, what, what do I feel about what's being said? What are the emotions that are going on in me at the moment? If we don't do that, what happens is that without noticing our own emotional level, we will then respond based on those emotional levels. Uh, th these emotional experiences we have in you will respond on that basis and in a way will enact them without being aware of them. For example, if I'm hearing something and actually it's, um, you know, it's, it's generating discomfort in me, it's generating maybe some anger, um, if I don't check this in me, if I don't look at it, if I don't own it in a way, my reaction is likely to just respond, you know, enacting these emotions. So res respond, you know, with a much more animated voice, with a maybe much more defensive or ac accusatory voice, 
rather than just staying with the dialogue, staying with responding from my own perspective, rather than just responding from my own emotional experience without being aware of it. If I'm aware of it, I may then say, okay, as you were speaking, I noticed that there was anger in me, and I think this anger is about this or is about that. This is a, this is a different way of working with the emotions because we've been able to name them and link, you know, where they come from uh, in relation to what's being said. But if we don't do this internal work in us, then uh, what's most likely to happen is that we will respond through enacting the anger and then we will tilt the dialogue into a debate rather than staying with a true generative dialogue which can take both parties into a new field. Hence the importance, as the other six, hence the importance of um, principle seven. Okay, so here we are. I've uh, described to you the seven principles of generative listening. And um, what's left for me to say is, um, you know, whenever you enter a conversation and whilst you're having it, maybe jot down the seven principles and, you know, read them before you start and maybe sometime during the conversation so that you can um, start to discipline yourself to enter that disposition for those conversations that are important. And I'm sure that they will bring, um, you know, generative um, outcomes for you. In other words, they will take you and those you're talking to, to new places where you can do new things to, together and be a lot more creative. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks for listening and uh, have a good conversation. Okay, so these were the seven principles for generative listening. I hope um, that they were clear enough. I hope I wasn't too long. Uh, perhaps another time I can also tell you about generative speaking, which of course is the other side of dialogue. But in the meantime, I can only invite you to enter the disposition of generative listening and um, experience what new possibilities they can bring to your own conversations. Thank you very much.